today we're gonna do a little shop tour. I'll show you around, show you some of the machines we use, and uh, just kind of show you the behind the scenes of Rose Anvil. Because contrary to what a lot of you guys might think, we do stuff other than YouTube videos. So let's go inside so I can actually see and show you around. So this is the shop. It's about 2,500 square feet. And we're in Logan, Utah. And we only rent out this front portion. All this over here is not ours, even though we have some stuff in it. So let's start going through the machines, starting with my favorite machine, the laser cutter. So this is what we do 90% of the wallet manufacturing on. It's super fast. It allows us to kind of change the designs on the fly and do smaller projects. So if we want to do like 10 of something, we don't have to, we don't have to buy like a $500 die just to do 10. The thing that's nice about this is it's got a giant bed and you can open these little side slots and you can fit an entire hide all the way through this. So that allows you to put an entire hide in without having to cut into pieces and cut as many wallets as possible. I love this machine. And then over here is the other side of the shop that's not mine, even though we store some leather and the packaging in this pallet racking area that the landowner is just really nice to us. So this, this whole section here is basically all devoted to the camera harnesses. And a lot of people don't know that we even make camera harnesses. But this is probably our most popular thing. Um, it's a camera harness for photographers who wanna carry, or wanna switch between lenses, but without actually having to switch. So they carry two cameras, like a lot of wedding photographers use these. So they can carry two different cameras on each of these sides be able to take a photo, switch to the camera, take a different photo without having to switch switch lenses. Um, and this whole area is kind of devoted to making these. So, starting with this machine, this is a Skyver, and as you can tell from our previous take, we already did this. But basically what this does is it takes the thickness of leather and allows you to split it to different thicknesses. This, like this is what I meant. See how it's just kind of splitting it to a thinner thickness. Let's see if I pull it out. Just like that. Okay. And then this whole bin is all the belly portions of the hide. Because in a camera harness where you've got a lot of weight and an expensive gear hanging on it, you don't want to use the belly portion of a hide that's really stretchy and maybe not as strong. So this whole bin is uh, belly scraps that we turn into coasters, um, mouse pads, keychains, just stuff that doesn't need the strength. This machine is a strap cutter. Switch this over. And this machine allows you to cut several straps of various thicknesses at the same time. So we use this mostly for the belts. So if I grab a scrap, turn it on. So there's just basically circular knives in here and this leather gets pulled through and it cuts it into the various thicknesses. If they fall into the machine and die on camera. Just like that. And obviously they'd be longer than that. And that's what these hides are mostly here for. So these are hides that we'll send through the strap in order to make belts and um, straps for. Next is part of the machine that gets used most in the shop and that's the clicker press. This is basically just a 25 ton forced cookie cutter. And we have all the different shapes of the, like this is a coaster, keychain, clawed wallet, and the clods are the only wallet we cut on this. Um, and this might not be interesting to anybody, but on a laser cutter, we get a lot of parts that we, it's, it takes a lot of time to line it up correctly when we get to the smaller pieces. So that we use a clod wall and the clicker press so that we can grab smaller pieces and position it fairly quickly and cut out more efficiently, I guess. Um, but we'll have some B-roll on how this all works and give you an example of what it looks like. Um, but yeah, we cut um, basically every single part of the harness we cut out on here. And then once we have everything cut out, we kind of file it away 
into the different parts of the harnesses. And they're all kind of color coordinated and lists the which piece and how long and how many holes. And then when we get an order, we've got like this, basically like a shopping list of all the different parts needed for the harness. So we kind of come along here, whichever color, grab the parts that we need, come along and just get everything. And then over here is the hardware for all the harnesses, pull all the hardware. And usually we would just kind of make it at this table because this is kind of the old filming table and uh, now the main building table. But it's covered in leather because we've got a new batch of Wicked and Craig in and we're still kind of sorting through it. Also, look at the DuPont sign. Everyone who's been here forever probably misses the DuPont sign. This is a belt making station. So we basically got four different Weaver leather machines. Um, Weaver leather makes really good machines for people who are doing smaller batch production. If you're not doing 100 belts a day, but you're doing maybe one or two a day, or more than you want to cut by hand, they offer really great machines for that um, smaller batch production leather companies. So these ones are basically a smaller version of the 25 ton clicker press that cut the ends of the belts like this. I'll kind of show you how that works. So you put your entire belt in here, obviously, not just a scrap. Push down. And you've got, well, it's supposed to look like that, to tell your belt. And then this one, let's grab the scrap over here. This one is for the other end of the belt. But the buckle goes on. See that? Buckle would go in there. And you've got your little micro adjustments on there. So it makes it so much easier to make these belts instead of trying to line these up perfectly every single time. This machine is really cool in it. I, uh, I love this one. So this is the their crease creaser and, or embosser. Um, basically you can get little rolls of whatever print you want made and you can roll your strap through like this. Oops, I already screwed it up. And it embosses a little print on your belt. Super cool. And this is uh, a little Hulk puncher, a rotary hole puncher. So if you've got a long strap, you need a, lots of hole, a lot of holes in, you can kind of push this along. Do you even have any scraps around that would? Okay, well this one already has holes in it, but just to give you an example of what it does. So you can set this to punch holes at certain lengths or distances, I guess. So that you've got equal holes all the way across, like that. Next is the sewing machine. It's just a big console cylinder arm sewing machine. We don't really use this in production, but it's really nice for production or uh, prototyping and just playing around. This is my old, I don't even know why we still have this on here. This is my old heat embosser before we got the new one, which I'll show you in a second. And then this area, this is kind of the wallet production area because wallets take a long time to stitch. Some of these, like the Clayton wallet, I think it takes on average like 45 minutes to stitch, don't you think? 30 to 45 minutes. So it's kind of hard to stand all day while you're stitching wallets. So we'll sit here and kind of stitch up stuff and. Um, yeah, just stitch wallets. And then another weaver machine is our burger shirt. Oops. So this is how we um, make the edges of the wallets nice and shiny and nice and finished. We've got a sanding drum on one end and then the burnishing wheel on the other. Next is the newer version of the heat embosser. So this is a quick print. Um, this is a fairly old machine, but it works so well. You basically turn the heat on, it heats up this whole brass area with the Rose Anvil logo there. Then you can swap out different brass stamps, like this is Schmood's face print, I think. Face, what was it, is this on coasters? Uh, I think it was a patch. This is this is Schmood's uh, face patch that he, we do out of leather for him. Uh, you can just kind of swap them out and it's a really handy machine. It's not heated up, but I'll kind of show you what it would look like if it was heated up. 
here's some examples of getting the right temperature. But you basically line up the wallet or the harness, or whatever, and press down. And then you've got a nice heat embossed logo in there, or face, whatever. Next machine. So this is, I feel like I've said all the machines are my favorite machines, but this one is another one of my favorite machines. So this is a Stimson rivet setter, and this might be the most dangerous machine in the shop because this thing is so powerful and there's no safeties on it anywhere, and you could easily just put a rivet right through your thumb. So, um, let me grab another strap and I'll show you. I don't remember when this machine was made. I think it was in the 50s or 60s. Um, but basically, you turn it on. It's got a hopper with all the rivets in there. You put your little cap in the base, and this thing's so powerful, you don't even have to have holes pre-cut into the leather for it to push through it. And this is 10 ounce, 11 ounce, probably 10 ounce Chrome XL from Horween, and it just cuts through it like butter. Cuts through it like butter. <laughs> Forgot to check if it was loaded. So, pretty powerful machine. It's scary, but I love it. No one's no one's uh, riveted their thumb yet, but we'll, we'll see. This area is kind of the quality control area. So after we get whatever product it is done, whether it's a harness or like hardware for the harnesses or wallets or whatever, someone who didn't make it, we kind of come over here and quality control each other's work based on what's on the order form and what's on that list of parts and everything that I showed you earlier. And um, once, and this is also kind of where I film like all the different shots of in the videos is like obviously I probably enjoy the Croc Martins. Um, so I, this is where we'd shoot like kind of the B-roll for the videos. Um, also we got a sick pair of Jim Greens in with the custom Rose Anvil logo on it. Um, and then once we're done with the quality control, we kind of move over to the shipping area. This is this is kind of Brittany's domain. So Brittany's, she does all the customer service. She's the nicest person in the world and the most patient person in the world. So if you ever dealt with customer service from us, other than hitting me up on Instagram or in the comment section, you've dealt with Brittany and you know how nice she is. And she does all the shipping and all the customer service, emails and everything like that. And this is kind of her area. So that's the front half of the shop. Now let's kind of move to the back, towards the back half of the shop. And one more thing I, I forgot to show you. And then I feel like none of this is interesting to anybody but me, but I love all this stuff. So this is like how we store the extra parts for the wallets. So all the different parts for the various harnesses that aren't stitched go in these. You know, whatever. The finished wallets go in here. And we don't usually have too many that are actually in stock. I would say 95% of what we do is made to order. But when we do have a big sale coming up, we'll stock up. So now let's go to the back of the shop to the more motorcycles and fun stuff that I never get to work on. So this is our extra hardware storage just for the harnesses and whatever. This is where we pull leather from that we're currently working on. So just the different colors of harness leather, um, extra packaging for the harnesses. This is where we will store that leather that's on the working table. Um, we need to have a few more rows so we can separate a little more evenly. That's where that leather goes. Two little Honda Expresses people see in videos on occasion. Uh, woodworking equipment. Parts washer is over here since I never get to work on motorcycles anymore. This is this is one of my favorite machines that isn't running. Um, this is a Carl Kraus heat press. So basically like that quick print, but on a bigger level. This can push with a lot more force. Um, Campbell Randall refurbished this for some guy and then he just gave it to me, which was awesome. But I just haven't got it set up yet. I don't even have a big enough um, print to even use it for yet. 
but one day I'll actually use it. Uh, next, our giant American flag. And anytime this is ever in the background, people get so mad because it's touching the ground, but it's not touching the ground. Let's see, we got at least two inches of clearance. This is one of my personal projects that never gets worked on. 62 pre-unit Triumph. One day I'll have time for it. Um, this is just general leather working tools and equipment. When Maybe if we're stitching a bunch of wallet, wallets, we'll wheel this over there, wash some TV while we stitch, and you know, pull the different equipment from here. This is where we make all the inlaid wedding rings for men, mostly. So right now we've got a couple of them on the mandrel here. Can do a close up of this. So this one looks like it's a walnut and turquoise that I'm working on. And occasionally I make wedding rings, not very often. I don't have as much time as I'd like to. But this is kind of all that equipment, different silversmithing equipment, goldsmithing, metal, mini metal lathe, the wood lathe. Yeah, that's where all that works. Bathrooms. Um, this area, this is my one little area devoted to mechanicing. And that's the triumph I'm currently working on. I got a lot done during the coronavirus, but um, things started picking up again and I didn't get to work on it as much as I wanted to. So one day I'll finish it. Um, tools, my big tool bench or tool, what is it called? Tool cabinet, I guess. And then all the tanks up here for different, all the different Triumphs and Hondas and Yamahas that I've kind of collected over the years and rebuilt. Then to the shop that you've probably seen a lot more of is the filming area. So yeah. It's a lot messier than it looks on camera, especially over in this area. So this is like where all the editing happens and all my daily office work and then the lighting and all the shoes and boots that I'm slowly hoarding all over the place. So that's kind of it for the tour. So let's go through all those Q&A questions and answer some questions. What city is your shop in? Logan, Utah. Don't come steal my stuff. Have you received any backlash from brands owning the shoes you've reviewed? Um, a little bit here and there. No cease and desist letters by any means, but uh, there's been a few companies that are a little upset that reached out. How has the COVID-19 situation affected your business? We had a really slow month and um, you know, I think it affected us just like every other business. Fortunately, we had the YouTube for me to kind of keep myself busy and it allows me to have a, a different source of revenue during coronavirus stuff. So it definitely affected us. But actually we got a lot of support from the YouTube channel. So all of you guys who bought wallets and belts and harnesses all through that, thank you. It made a huge difference. Have you ever thought of alternative career paths? I don't have any plans that for any other alternative careers currently. When I, I graduated from Utah State University with a bachelor's in marketing, before that I was studying engineering. I took a year or two off and did um, trade school to learn welding, machining. Before that I was a firefighter, so I just kind of bounced around all over the place, but I've always loved working with my hands and making something and just kind of where I ended up. Does Toaster live at the shop or do you take Toaster home with you every night? He does not live at the shop. Um, he lives at me with lives with me at my house, and I just truck him in every day or two just to hang out. What is Toaster's backstory? So I got Toaster two or three years ago from a breeder who bought him as a breeding stud all the way from Russia. Um, but when she got Toaster, he refused to breed, and so she didn't have a use for him because he wasn't producing any baby kitties, and so. She was just trying to get rid of him, and I just happened to be looking for a Devon Rex and talked to the lady, and she's like, well, I got this one cat who refuses to breed. He's kind of uh, lethargic all the time. He's just kind of a dud if you want him. And I was like, sold, and that's how I got Toaster. When are you making your own high-quality white shoes? Um, I don't have any immediate plans for it, but I still, depends on what we we see on the other white sneakers. If there's if there's no white sneakers out there that do it to how I think it could be done, I, I might explore the option, but no immediate plans for the future. But 
there's still a chance. Depends. How did Roseanville Shop come about? Is your name Roseanville? My name is Weston K, not Roseanville. I still get emails every day. They're like, Dear Miss Rose. And I'm like, My name's Weston and I'm a dude, but I appreciate it. Um, I kind of told the backstory already, but the name Roseanville kind of has a cool story, I think. Um, when I was decided to name the business, I, I wanted to kind of name it after a couple people who had a huge influence on my life, which were my grandparents. I was raised in a small town, Mona, Utah. I was raised on a farm and my I was really close to my grandparents. I was just up the road from them and I worked on the farm with my grandpa and my grandma was this like super big gardener. She had this one acre lot that was full of roses. And so I wanted to use those two as kind of an inspiration for the name because my grandpa was this hardworking farmer uh, who was kind of a hard guy who was, uh, so I wanted a part of the name to be named after him. The other part I wanted to be named after my grandma who kind of taught me the artistic side of things, who she's a really well-known artist in the community. She had a huge rose garden and she just kind of has a romantic view on things. And I think both those attributes kind of shaped me into this hard working guy who loves the work, but also this um, inspired the artistic side of me. So took the rose aspect from my grandma, the anvil aspect from my grandpa, just kind of combined them. And that's where Rose Anvil came from. When will we be getting a video about the Nike Air Force Ones? I think in two weeks, I think is the Air Force One video. How did you become a leather worker? So both of my grandpas, my mom's dad and my dad's dad, were both leather workers. My dad was a leather worker, so I've just kind of always been around it and got more serious when I was in college, kind of like I talked about earlier. Do you have any desires to expand your product range, bags, slippers, shoes, guitar strap, rebuilds, or repairs of leather products? So I would like to get into that type of products um, eventually. Bags take a lot of leather. They're very expensive to make and sell. And I, it takes me a really long time to design and make products available for sale because I, I get a little obsessive over the design. And unless I can figure out a way to make something better or more unique or improve a current version of whatever's out there, I have a hard time wanting to sell it. So for a bag, if, unless I can figure out a, a really cool and innovative way to make a leather bag, it's not interesting to me. So if that, if that spark ever, if I ever get an idea that's like, oh, I could do this and it's gonna be different, then I would, I would maybe venture into bags and guitar straps and stuff. But until then, I just kind of roll things out as I get interested in them. Do you personally make all Rose Anvil's products? No, so I have a small team of three people. I've got me, Garrett, Brittany, that does the customer service that we talked about earlier, and Tyler. And between the four of us, we do everything in Rose Anvil. I, I mostly do like the YouTube channel, the overall business stuff, growing the business, new product design and development. Um, Tyler does, he helps me with the YouTube videos and helps with production. Garrett helps with production, and Brittany does um, the customer service and occasionally helps with production. Love the channel, but how's Toaster? Toaster's good. He lives a comfortable life. He gets to explore in the shop all day and uh, hang out with people. How does the how does he like the harness? He I think because he has shorter fur, he enjoys uh, or he doesn't mind the harness. And the harness is for when I take him on walks. I think a lot of people just are like, well, he just put a harness on his cap. But I actually take toaster for walks around on occasion, especially in the summer. Um, and I actually have a video coming out where I'm gonna make a, uh, a harness out of cordovan, which is the world's most expensive leather. And I think I'm gonna make all the hardware out of solid gold. So that's gonna be a fun one. What does an average working day look like for you when you're not dissecting shoes? Uh, most of my time is spent on trying to grow the business, uh, working on the YouTube channels, working on marketing, product photos, new product development. Um, I would say maybe 20% of my time is spent on the actual manufacturing of the products. Um, maybe 40% of my time is spent on planning out videos, working with sponsors, filming videos, editing videos, and then the remaining 40% is just trying to grow the, the business, dealing with the boring business stuff like emails and all the stuff that no one wants to do when they own a business that you have to do. Next question, will you ever cut up luxury brands? Yeah, that's the goal, is to be able to do like 
Prada, Gucci, and some of those high-end brands and really see how much you're paying for designer brands. Uh, but they're, they're really expensive. So kind of working up to it. Sponsors help out a lot. Um, all the traffic helps with AdSense to be able to afford them eventually. So the goal is to get to the point where we're doing some stupid price products to see what's really going on inside of them. And the other half of that question, what is the best leather you can get? What is the highest quality leather like? So I would say pretty universally, people would agree that Shell Cordovan is the top, top of the best leather. Uh, most leather is $15 a square foot and under. Shell Cordovan is about $150 a square foot. And I actually have some pieces. So the most popular maker of Shell Cordovan is Horween. So this piece would be like $100. Um, the benefit of this is it doesn't wrinkle like leather, it just kind of rolls, it's really durable, and it keeps its shine for a really long time. But it's super pricey. But everyone who knows leather, this is kind of the, the holy grail of leather products. Eventually I'm gonna launch a Shell Cordovan wallet line, but not yet. I'm still kind of designing all of them. Where do you see the future of Rose Anvil? Um, I don't really know. I When I started this, I didn't think this would be my career. I just, it was just like a little side gig in college. And then we did the, then I started making wedding rings and I was like, maybe I'll be the wedding ring maker. And then we did the camera harness and that took off. And then I was like, turns out I'm a camera accessories guy. And then the YouTube took off. And then all of a sudden I'm cutting boots and shoes and half on YouTube. Um, so I don't really know where it's gonna go. It's kind of, I just kind of follow whatever interests me and whatever works and whatever I enjoy doing my time the most that also is growing the business. Um, six months ago, if you would have told me, or nine months ago, if you would have told me that I would have almost 200,000 subscribers on YouTube and I'd be spending the majority of my time working on YouTube, I never would have believed you, but here we are. So um, I think that's a good question to wrap it up on. Um, maybe I'll do another Q and A in a few months, another shop tour because we are, we're moving shop, as you can see, we've kind of outgrown this shop. We've, we've kind of expanded into stuff that's not our area. And we're moving down to Salt Lake pretty soon. So when we get into that shop, maybe we'll do another shop tour and another Q&A. But until then, thank you guys so much for all your support. Thanks for the questions. Hopefully this answered the majority of them. And um, seriously, I appreciate your guys' support. This YouTube uh, channel has been so much fun and I love doing it. And uh, thank you, see ya.